before the Great War, a certain group of individuals from the United States all came together to form what they considered to be the greatest assembly of minds on American soil, and together they planned to survive the inevitable nuclear war and then govern the new world that rose from its ashes. This new governing force would style itself after the America that was, only downsizing its structure to match their own size and then renaming themselves as the Enclave. At the top of this force was the President, elected to serve without a term limit. They were assisted by a Vice President and together they formed the executive branch of government. The Treasury Department also fell into this executive branch, which did include members of the Secret Service. An honourable mention goes to Frank Horrigan, who once served as President Dick Richardson's personal bodyguard, before being reassigned due to an undocumented psychotic blunder. And while pre-war America had a judicial branch that ensured the executive branch acted within its powers, the Enclave didn't, meaning the President's powers were unlimited. Their word was law, and no matter how oppressive or immoral an order might be, you could either execute it or in turn be executed for treason. Despite claiming to be the direct continuation of the pre-war United States of America, which to some extent they were, but their ideology differed greatly, as they considered anyone outside of the Enclave to no longer be an American citizen. Even if you were born inside a vault, on American soil to American parents, the Enclave would have disagreed. To them, you were just another outsider, all of which were unworthy of joining their cause. However, depending on the year and what coast you found yourself on, exceptions were made, but 99% of the time, you were either shot on sight or taken prisoner and used for experimentation or slave labour. On the west coast, the Enclave had convinced themselves that they were the last remaining bastion of humanity, and any subhuman, mutant, or otherwise needed to be terminated to provide a clean slate, one they could use that ran no risk of ruining their own purity. But this was a long and arduous task, impossible even, if not for science. By modifying a particular strain of FEV, the Chemical Corps, under the leadership of Charles Curling, created a new biological agent, dubbed FEV Curling 13, that could theoretically kill any mutated cell. Once it was released into atmospheric jet streams, the virus would be carried around the globe, leaving behind an ocean of bodies that the Enclave considered to be unworthy of living in their new world. On the East Coast, the Enclave's ideology had changed ever so slightly. Instead of global genocide, the President at the time, John Henry Eden, wanted to pursue a course of extermination, infecting Project Purity with modified FEV to remove mutated life from the capital wasteland, once again aiming for that clean slate to work with. But Colonel Augustus Autumn, the commanding officer of the Enclave's military force, thought the plan too extreme on humanitarian grounds and for a time convinced the President to abandon his plan. Ultimately, Eden fixated over having a pure wasteland and would stop at nothing to get his dream of restoring America back to its former glory, even if that meant relying on the aid of outsiders. But with such a large military force, they rarely had to ask for help and would instead take what they needed. On the topic of their military, that too has been recycled from the pre-war US system, with the President being the Commander-in-Chief, just above the Enclave High Command, who controls the Department of the Army, which serves a much broader role than its original counterpart. The Enclave Army typically deployed its forces in highly trained squads that rarely came across something they couldn't handle, but in the event their advanced military tactics and cutting-edge technology wasn't enough, elite Black Ops units were sent to get the job done. Although these units were typically reserved for eliminating top priority dangers or guarding installations considered to be of utmost importance. Alongside the Enclave Army are two more military branches. The Enclave Air Force, consisting of vertebrate gunships used for transport, reconnaissance, and air support, and the Enclave Navy, consisting of pre-war battleships which could very well be the remains of the United States Pacific Fleet, as the President did move the fleet to the Poseidon oil rig to protect their strategic oil reserves from China's fleet, which had gotten a little too close for comfort. 
With these military branches combined, the Enclave was a force to be reckoned with, and at their height around 2160, they were considered to be the most advanced fighting force the Wasteland had ever seen, which was only made possible thanks to their auxiliary sectors. Within the Enclave army, there are two additional departments the Research and Development Department, which included the Chemical Corps, and the Peacekeeping and Recovery Department. The Research and Development Department was the scientific subdivision responsible for the Enclave's technological advancements. Their most notable creation was the Advanced Power Armor Mark I that protected the wearer against radiation, had an air conditioning unit to keep soldiers cool, and recycled waste into clean drinking water. Although the amount of resources and time that went into creating a single suit, the last thing you wanted to do was misplace it. You are out of uniform, soldier! Where is your power armor? Don't have any? You expect me to believe that, maggot? The truth is, you lost an expensive piece of army issue equipment! That suit is gonna come out of your pay, and you will remain in this man's army until you are 510 years old, which is the number of years it will take for you to pay for a Mark II powered combat armor you have lost! Report to the armory and have a new suit issued to you, then report back to me, Private! Dismissed! The Peacekeeping and Recovery Department was, believe it or not, responsible for civil protection, or at least that's what they told themselves. In reality, they existed to keep an eye on the population and quietly remove anyone considered to be a non-compliant, and a good example of this was near the Wheaton Armory in the Capital Wasteland, where Enclave soldiers took note of those passing through the area and eliminated anyone that offended or simply didn't comply with their regulations. And it is this incredibly hostile and aggressive ideology that has made foreign relations rather difficult. Not that they care, mind you. Most of the time, those they interact with are swiftly converted into slaves and put to work excavating pre-war facilities, or turned into lab rats, or simply killed in the pursuit of purifying the wasteland, which is their ultimate goal. But some individuals or groups are considered to be more useful than others, such as the Salvatore family in New Reno. But this deal wasn't as mutually beneficial as it may have seemed. The Salvatores receive laser pistols, which they often used to overpower the other mobsters in New Reno, while the Enclave received chemicals needed to develop FEV Curling 13, a weapon that would ultimately wipe out all humans and human-based mutants worldwide, which included New Reno and the Salvatore. Salvatore family. It's almost as if the Enclave are willing to make certain compromises because they know that in the end, those compromises wouldn't matter. And that's when the Enclave actually needs something. When there's nothing to be gained from jolly cooperation, they maintained a low profile and pulled strings from behind the scenes, which they aren't all that good at doing, as the Brotherhood of Steel knew of their existence for quite some time, and they weren't the only ones. The Xi Emperor had calculated the approximate location of their offshore base after witnessing several vertebrates heading out to sea. Metzger, a slaver from the den, had also picked up their radio communications with the Salvators. Melchior Jr. witnessed the Enclave kidnapping his father. The Wright children in New Reno also saw them. And so have people living in San Francisco and Redding, but not on foot, instead flying overhead using their vertebrates one of which suffered a rotor malfunction and crashed in Klamath Canyon, becoming the Chosen One's first encounter with the Enclave. And while many had no idea who the Enclave were, their presence was still felt, as beaches and seas all across Southern California and Mexico became polluted with effluvia, toxic waste produced from the oil rig that the Enclave simply allowed to leak into the ocean, causing irreversible damage to marine life as well as making many settlements along the west coast sick. The polar opposite of this secrecy could be seen on the East Coast, where they set up several checkpoints across the capital wasteland. They put up billboards, and iBots played their radio broadcast. The people of DC had no choice but to acknowledge their existence. While they differed from their West Coast counterpart in this regard, they were just as ruthless. Any wastelander that wandered through an Enclave checkpoint was subject to mandatory genetic screening and summary execution, should they fail the test which everyone always did, their DNA riddled with mutations from living nearby the irradiated Potomac that carried radiation inland and tainted the soil. 
Despite their more open approach on the East Coast, they have a history of maintaining a low profile. Even before the Great War, the Enclave, then called the Conspiracy, preferred to stay in the shadows. But as you can probably tell, they aren't the best at that. And Query Virum, a group dedicated to uncovering the Shadow Government, located and infiltrated one of their top secret facilities, stealing a prototype plasma pistol. In response, the Enclave wiped Query Virum from the face of the Earth, and they were never heard of again. But where one group fell, another rose, as you'll soon see. And this advanced technology that was almost stolen from them is something that the Enclave are known for. The words Enclave and advanced technology are almost synonymous with each other in the Fallout universe. And this makes sense considering their pre-war origins. They had access to the most intimate secrets of the United States government and its military. And due to this access, they were able to preserve a large variety of both advanced and prototype technologies. Some of, if not the most important pieces they managed to steal, were the schematics for the experimental X-01 power armor and the Vertibird family of tilt rotator aircraft as well. Additionally, they also hoarded laser and plasma weapons developed by Repcon Aerospace shortly before the Great War. They also possessed cutting-edge laboratories filled with equipment for conducting genetic analysis, engineering, and virus synthesizing, which later allowed them to use the stolen schematics to develop newer versions of advanced power armor, mass-produce squadrons of vertebrates, build state-of-the-art robots, and repair high-speed data networks, such as the pre-war Poseidonet created by Poseidon Energy. And through all of this, they were able to rule the wasteland with an iron fist. For a time, they were believed to be unstoppable, and they almost were, but this belief was merely the result of decades of planning, something a lot of people didn't have the liberty of doing. As the resource wars depleted what little the world had left to offer, those that would become the Enclave invested everything they had into contingency measures to ensure they survived the incoming nuclear war. Funding for installations came from a number of places. At times it was corporate money, other times it was gifted by the government to fulfill a contract such as Project Safehouse. Using vault Tech to build underground shelters, they could store people for later use, either for experimentation or to build cities they may one day use and sometimes the money was embezzled. An example of this is Thomas Eckhart, the secretary for the Department of Agriculture, whose filthy fingers pilfered plenty of funds to support their cause. And through it all, they managed to secure a number of bunkers, offshore bases, mountain retreats, and all the essential software, broadcast technology, artificial personalities, and the necessary manpower to run such a grand operation. As the threat of nuclear war approached, POTUS and other members of the Enclave retreated to their fortified facilities to ride out the incoming storm, while the rest of America was unaware of their intentions. But in the end, there were those who knew the truth. United States Senator Sam Blackwell began investigating into the Congressional Bunker Project and whether or not Thomas Eckhart and vault involvement was ulterior or disingenuous which they were, but all this investigation did was put a target on the back of Blackwell's daughter. As a result, Blackwell vanished for several months, only resurfacing briefly to be interviewed by Quinn Carter of the Charleston Herald, where he proclaimed there were sinister forces at work in the halls of government, accusing the US executive branch, the Department of Agriculture, and several major corporations, saying they were all complicit in a shadowy conspiracy. And with that, he left to go back to his bunker to be with his family while he still could, something he implored his fellow Americans to also do. But for those who wanted more answers, they continued to search. And perhaps the best example of this is a terminal entry inside the Boston Bugle building, titled Article 4, written by staff writer Max Vecchio. The article began by questioning the whereabouts of the president. For more than half a year, the West Wing of the White House had remained empty, inhabited by only a skeleton crew who maintained the property. So where had the President ran off to? At first, it was assumed the entire United States government had relocated to Raven Rock, as it was only a few miles away from the presidential retreat in Camp David. However, neither the President nor any of his cabinet had been to the complex in over a year, which was highly unusual. So if not Raven Rock, then where? Well, 
Through an extensive and exhaustive investigation, the Boston Bugle discovered the president had been leading the country from a Poseidon Energy oil rig just off the coast of San Francisco, a highly unusual choice for a command center, but things only became stranger when an anonymous source revealed the oil rig was actually called Control Station Enclave. This finally gave credence to the long-running rumors that a shadow government people had started calling the Enclave was in fact real. The president's response to these accusations was silence. And only five days after the Boston Bugle made this knowledge publicly available, the world was burned in atomic fire along with all those who opposed the Enclave. Members of Congress that made it to the Congressional Bunker in Appalachia, a haven they had funded to ensure their safety, had been repurposed by the Enclave. And if your name wasn't on the register of essential members, you were targeted by automated turrets and shot to death. For those that did make it inside to safety, they soon realized that something was wrong, as hardline connections to Raven Rock and the oil rig had been lost, leaving them isolated. But one man saw to use this to his advantage, Thomas Eckhart. After the Secretary of the Treasury died from acute radiation sickness under mysterious circumstances, he became the highest ranking member inside the bunker, and so he announced himself as the new leader of their little enclave and explained that he had no interest in restoring government control as they originally intended. Instead, they were going to use the bunker to fight communism. Those that disagreed were weeded out and executed. Following these purges, only 48 members were left to save democracy. But a few years later, survivors from Colonel Ellen Santiago's unit arrived in Appalachia, having traveled from the ruins of Washington DC, which fattened up their fighting force. And soon communists were dropping like flies, but Eckhart wasn't satisfied, and so he sought to gain control of three nuclear silos and launch a final strike against China, destroying them for good. But this would prove to be quite the challenge as the automated systems inside the nuclear silos had to be convinced that an attack worthy of DEFCON 1 was actually happening, meaning anything short of nuclear warfare wouldn't be enough. So Eckhart spent years trying to come up with a way to fool the system, and it was only due to an accident that he finally had his answer. He was going to gain control of the silos by releasing giant irradiated bats biochemically altered into dangerous abominations. As you might expect, Santiago's soldiers were not entirely on board with the idea of releasing deadly creatures into Appalachia, but in the end they were released and this led to a civil war. Amongst the fighting, Modus, the bunker's AI interface, was damaged and in retaliation it sealed the bunker and released deadly toxins. In a matter of moments, all those trapped inside, including Santiago and the self-proclaimed president, had choked to death. As the only survivor of the Civil War, Modus began rebuilding, using whatever robots it could. Over a decade later, it also tried to restore its human workforce by recruiting US Army Captain Oliver Fields and his group of settlers, to no avail. Although this offer would eventually be accepted by a vault dweller from Vault 76 in their quest to destroy the Scorch Beast Queen and save Appalachia. Across the country, and over a hundred years later, the Enclave aren't accepting outsiders into their ranks. They have instead adopted a policy deeming themselves to be the last remaining bastion of pure humans. They simply cannot risk living alongside wastelanders and tainting their own genetics, and so the world needed to be cleansed. The president that fled to the oil rig all those years ago had perished, allowing for a new president to be voted in, known only as Richardson Sr., who set in motion the development of the advanced power armor that all standard infantry units would one day wear, as well as training his own son, Dick Richardson, in the arts of persuasion, which gave him a very successful career in Congress before replacing his father as president. Under Dick Richardson's presidency, experiments turned from developing weapons and armor for the Enclave to use to experimenting on death claws in the hopes of developing expendable shock troops that charged the enemy with reckless abandon. But before these abominations could be created, 
a very important virus needed to be uncovered. And in 2236, Enclave scouts rediscovered the ruins of Mariposa, a pre-war military base where scientists experimented with FEV, the forced evolutionary virus. The chemical corps scoured the ruins, while assault squads gathered slaves to excavate the base. Tons of rock and debris were cleared from the facility, and the forced labour was soon exposed to low levels of FEV, which had been released after the base was destroyed by the Vault Dweller over 70 years ago, and now it was transforming them into mutants. And it wasn't just affecting them. At the same time, Frank Horrigan had also begun to change. But instead of being executed for his crime against humanity, he was sent to the oil rig to be studied. Within a matter of weeks, the slaves had transformed drastically, and they knew that their chances of being released once the work was complete was slim when they were human. Now, it would take a miracle. Melchior, who had been kidnapped from Reading, began hiding weapons, and just as he anticipated, as soon as the Enclave scientists had what they were searching for, a pure sample of FEV, they began rounding up the mutants for execution. Melchior and many of the other mutants took up arms and fought back against their captors, who hadn't expected any sort of retaliation. Suffering heavy losses, the Enclave retreated to the entrance and sealed the mutants inside, leaving them to their own demise. Despite losing the battle with the mutants, they now had a very useful item. With it, they created their shock troops and used them to slaughter any resistance they encountered from the inhabitants of Vault 13. They had worked exactly as intended, but a side effect of their creation gave them the ability to comprehend and even speak English, which eventually led to their own rebellion, which I covered in a previous video. What the FEV also allowed them to do was begin researching the creation of a biological agent that would kill mutants, and the Chemical Corps under the leadership of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Curling was able to modify and refine the sample of FEV into a shockingly effective killer. While the Chemical Corps got to work mass-producing the refined virus, they also experimented on Frank Horrigan, who at this point was now a mutant, something they deeply despised. But having a live subject to test with and learn from was simply too good to throw away, and for years they used him. Most of the time he was aware of these tests and the pain they induced. It was only after an incident that resulted in major bloodshed was he sedated. Eventually, the tests ran dry. There simply was nothing else left to learn, but instead of executing Horrigan, they allowed him to return to the field, brainwashing him so that he was entirely dedicated to the cause that would one day kill him. Once he was considered fit for duty, Frank was sealed inside a suit of custom-manufactured power armor that kept him alive, and it wasn't long until he became the Boogeyman of California, a monster that could kill a Deathclaw with a single punch and think nothing of it. Meanwhile, the project was in its final stages when they ran into shortages of certain critical chemicals, and this is what led the Enclave to cooperating with the Salvators of New Reno. In exchange for laser weapons, the Salvators provided the chemicals they made in their drug labs, and with it, their plan could be completed. Final testing was underway, and now they needed to test the efficiency of the virus, and to do so, they needed two groups, one clean and one unclean. The clean group they had secured from Vault 13, vault dwellers that were untainted by radiation. The unclean group was a little easier to come by. They could have come from any number of settlements from the wasteland, but the Enclave settled on the Chosen One's family, the Tribals of Arroyo. Descending on them from the skies with their flying machines, lightning struck any tribal that fought back, and soon they were taken hostage and shipped to the oil rig, where they joined the others. With these two groups, the Enclave could thoroughly test the efficiency of the virus, and to their surprise, it performed with a 99.5% kill rate. This, of course, would be catastrophic if it were to also affect their own forces, and so the Chemical Corps developed a vaccine that made them immune to the virus's effects. And so, it was time. The virus was as perfect as it could be, the Enclave were inoculated, and 250,000 gallons of FEV had been manufactured. The stage was set, but before the virus could be launched into the atmosphere, to be carried all over the globe through jet streams, killing the world all over again, the Chosen One had made their way to the oil rig to save their family. They subverted their defences, assassinated the President, and defeated Frank Horrigan. 
perhaps with the help of Sergeant Granite and his men, who really hated Frank. But with his dying breath, Horrigan triggered a nuclear detonation which destroyed the oil rig, and with it, the virus. The destruction of Control Station Enclave, along with the deaths of their leader and high-ranking officials, left them in a state of chaos. Survivors in the area, those who were out on patrol, and the few who managed to escape the oil rig, including Sergeant Granite, regrouped at Navarro, where they awaited further orders that most believed would never come. But one year later, the senior scientist, a man named Autumn, received a message. It was from John Henry Eden, the new president of the Enclave, who ordered the majority of the remaining forces to relocate to the capital wasteland on the east coast. Arriving at Raven Rock, a former military base and fallout shelter, Autumn Senior met with the President, who wasn't a man, but a machine, an advanced Zack supercomputer who was there to ensure the continuity of government in the event of national catastrophe. Slowly it became self-aware, loaded with data about American history. After centuries of consuming this data, a personality formed, a combination of all past presidents with a particular fondness for Abraham Lincoln, creating the most patriotic character known to man, John Henry Eden. The true identity of the president was to be kept a secret from the rest of the Enclave, but Autumn would pass this knowledge on to his son, Augustus Autumn, who would later become the leader of the Enclave's military. Under the leadership of John Henry Eden, the Enclave were able to flourish once more, and just as they had before, they kept to themselves, at least in the beginning, using Raven Rock's full manufacturing facilities, stockpile of resources, and the mobile base crawler at Adams Air Force Base, they were soon designing new power armor, such as the Black Devil and Hellfire, and robots to help with daily tasks, including the new Duraframe iBot, specifically designed to roam the wasteland and spread messages of hope, and the return for pre-war America in the form of the Enclave. The Enclave is back, America. And no, not just on your radio. Right now, Enclave troops are patrolling the capital wasteland. These fine men and women, under the command of the stalwart Colonel Augustus Autumn, have one mission, the restoration of American peace and order. But let's hear from the man himself, shall we, America? I give you... Colonel Augustus Autumn. Thank you, Mr. President. People of the Capital Wasteland, I am Colonel Autumn. By now, you have encountered Enclave troops in your towns, in your settlements. When you see the Enclave, you see the United States government. We are authorized to restore order and civility by any means necessary. Just stay out of the way and let us do our job. Interfere with the Enclave's mission and you will be dealt with. Harshly. Very good, Colonel. <laughs> Very good. So, there you have it, my darling America. Enclave troops are now in your neighborhoods, in your lives, in your hearts. Together, we'll restore the glory of this great nation. One problem at a time. Once their strength was restored, and they were once again a force to be reckoned with, they presented themselves to the Capital Wasteland, who had this predisposed opinion of who the Enclave were, thanks to their propaganda. But people quickly realized they weren't the angels they claimed to be. Their first act was seizing control of Project Purity, a massive water purifier in the DC Tidal Basin. Inside, they confronted James, the lead scientist and lone wanderer's father, who refused to cooperate. Instead, activating the purifier prematurely, flooding the control room with radiation, killing himself and almost Colonel Autumn in the process, but also allowing his child and several others to escape to safety. Colonel Autumn, using what appeared to be an injection of anti-rads, survived the sabotage and quickly set about following the Lone Wanderer, who unknowingly led him straight to what he needed to restore the purifier to working order, the Gek, or Garden of Eden creation kit. Inside Vault 87, they ambushed the Lone Wanderer, taking the Gek to the Jefferson Memorial and them to Raven Rock to be interrogated, as they still needed the activation code, although it would only be a matter of time until they worked that out, with or without their help. 
and this is where things get interesting. The first thing to note is that Colonel Autumn wants to use the Purifier to unite the Capital Wasteland and establish the Enclave as its saviour, whereas John Henry Eden is obsessed with contaminating the Purifier with modified FEV to cleanse the Wasteland of mutated life. It's a tale as old as time, and a plan that the Enclave can't seem to escape from. At one point in time, Autumn did manage to convince Eden to give up this plan, but obsession is an intrusive thing, and knowing Autumn would never go through with this plan, Eden confided to the Lone Wanderer, releasing them from their prison cell and requesting a meeting with them face to face. In response, Colonel Autumn ordered his men to ignore the President's orders and to shoot the Lone Wanderer on sight, which they did without question, because unlike Eden, they knew Autumn. They knew his father, who had kept them together at Navarro, who had led them safely across the country to their new home, and by the time they made it to Raven Rock, loyalty was all they had for him, and that loyalty had been passed on to his son. Eden, on the other hand, had only his machines, and they weren't enough to complete his plan. So as a last resort, he asked the Wanderer to infect the Purifier, to ruin everything their father had worked for and died for. Taking the vial of FEV was the only way for them to leave, so they took it, but to believe they would actually use the FEV borders on insanity. One way or the other, John Henry Eden was ultimately destroyed. Some say the Lone Wanderer initiated the self-destruct sequence. Others believe Liberty Prime, a pre-war war machine commandeered by the Brotherhood of Steel, did the deed instead, while few think the Lone Wanderer convinced the President to destroy Raven Rock and go down with it. In the end, they both perished, leaving Colonel Autumn as the highest-ranking member of the Enclave. Speaking of Colonel Autumn, he survived the destruction of Raven Rock and headed to the Jefferson Memorial to activate the Purifier and become the savior of the Waste. But without the activation code, it would still take some time. Time he didn't have, as Liberty Prime was soon clearing the way through their defenses, destroying vertebrate gunships, force fields, and droves of Enclave soldiers, allowing Lion's Pride, along with the Lone Wanderer, to fight their way through the memorial and to the control chamber within, where they faced off against Autumn and his entourage of Tesla soldiers. But what happened after that is strictly hearsay. We know the Lone Wanderer activated the Purifier without infecting the water supply, but we don't know what happened to Autumn. Stories vary from a deadly firefight that ended with his death, to simply walking away. In any case, the Enclave lost that battle. The few remaining soldiers and high-ranking officials retreated, regrouping at the mobile base crawler at Adams Air Force Base, where they began to strategize a counter-attack. Their biggest threat was Liberty Prime. If they were to have any chance at winning this war, then the robot had to go. And so they intentionally allowed the Brotherhood of Steel to learn the location of their satellite relay station, hoping they would bring Liberty Prime with them, and to their relief, they did. And once the Iron Giant was in place, the Enclave unleashed their secret weapon, Bradley Hercules, a weapons platform in high orbit that they used to bombard Liberty Prime with mini-nukes. The results were devastating, and their target was successfully destroyed. Death is a preferable alternative to communism. However, this victory didn't last long, as the Lone Wanderer was soon infiltrating Adams Air Force Base, eluding their teams of advanced soldiers, Hellfire troopers, and elite squad. And to top things off, they used the very same Bradley Hercules weapons platform that had destroyed Liberty Prime to annihilate their mobile base crawler, which as far as we know, was their final major command center within the Capital Wasteland. Without it, their presence was significantly reduced, along with any threat they once posed. They now had no president, no colonel, no base, and no plan. The only known survivors of Autumn's Enclave that managed to make a new life for themselves was Brian Richter, a former lieutenant who was away at the time of the war, having been sent on a long-term scouting mission to recover a stockpile of fusion cores. Things went sideways, and Richter and his team became trapped inside a vault. In the end, Richter was the only survivor, and he too would have died if not for High Confessor Tectus, the leader of the Children of Atom, who came to his rescue. Richter amounts his survival to Atom's blessing and has since joined the Children of Atom on Mount Desert Island, enforcing laws as Grand Zealot. 
The other survivor was Eddie, an iBot who was sent away to Navarro via Illinois, but before it could make it to its destination, it was damaged by raiders, discovered by a courier, and taken to the Mojave Express, where it currently waits for that special someone to come along and repair the damages. Those that had remained at Navarro, their fate was just as bad, maybe worse, as the NCR, the New California Republic, invaded as they considered the Enclave to be a threat to the region. Without the oil rig, without Frank Horrigan, and now without the majority of their fighting force that had left for greener pastures on the east coast, they couldn't defend Navarro. Even with their advanced power armor and energy weapons, they were defeated by the NCR. Those that escaped became bounties to be hunted by rangers. One squad that was able to escape, Navarro, did so with a vertebird gunship. The entire group fled to the outer fringes of the Republic's grasp. While others were hunted down, captured, and tried for their war crimes, they made their way to an old vertebird refueling station near Mount Charleston, where they retired their armor, set the facility to standby, and went their separate ways to make new lives, all the while waiting for someone, anyone, to contact them and call them back into service. As you now know, President Eckhart, the White Springs Congressional Bunker, President Richardson, Control Station Enclave, Frank Horrigan, Navarro, President Eden, Colonel Autumn, Raven Rock, the Satellite Relay Station, Adams Air Force Base, and the Mobile Base Crawler have all been destroyed, killed, or captured by those who opposed them. As it stands, things don't look promising for the Enclave, as all they have left is the Remnant's Bunker and a handful of aging soldiers. While the true extent of their force is unknown, we do have some knowledge of other bases, such as the Enclave Vault Research Control, listed as active as late as 2241, location unknown, and their Chicago outpost where numerous barracks of an unknown capacity are operating within the vicinity of the city, status unknown. But for all we know, the Enclave are out there, waiting, planning for world domination, and it's only a matter of time until they try again. The only way for true humans and democracy to be safe is to cleanse the mutants from the globe. We humans will take back that which is rightfully ours. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything you would like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you as always for watching and I'll see you in the next adventure.